Chapter One of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Secret Mission. I was twenty-five years of age that May evening of twenty-twenty when they sent me south into the lowlands. I had been in the National Detective Service Bureau and then was transferred to the Customs Department, Atlantic Lowlands Branch. I went alone. It was best, my commander thought. An assignment needing diplomacy rather than a show of force. It was 9 p.m. when I catapulted from the little stage of Long Island Airport, a fair, moonlit evening, a moon just beyond the full, rising to pale the eastern stars. I climbed about a thousand feet, swung over the headlands of the hook, and keeping in the thousand-foot local lane, took my course. My destination lay some thirteen hundred miles southeast of Great New York. I could do a good normal three-ninety in this fleet little wasp, especially if I kept in the rarer air pressure over the zero height. The thousand-foot lane had a southward drift this night. I was making now well over four hundred. I would reach Narita soon after midnight. The continental shelf slid beneath me, dropping away as my course took me further from the highland borders. The lowlands lay patched with inky shadows and splashes of moonlight, domes with upstanding rounded heads, plateaus of naked black rock, ten thousand feet below the zero height, trenches like valleys ridged and pitted, naked in places like a pockmarked lunar landscape. Or again, a pall of black mist would shroud it all, dark curtain of sluggish cloud with moonlight tinging its edges pallid green. To my left, eastward, toward the great basin of the mid-Atlantic lowlands, there was always a steady downward slope. To the right, it came up over the continental shelf to the highlands of the United States. There was often water to be seen in these lowlands, a spring-fed lake far down in a cauldron pit, spilling into a trench, low-lying, landlocked little seas, canyons, some of them dry, others filled with tumultuous, flowing water. Or great gashes with water sluggishly flowing, or standing, with a heavy slime and a pall of uprising vapor in the heat of the night. At thirty-seven degrees north and seventy degrees west, I passed over the newly named Atlas Sea, a lake of water here, more than a hundred miles in extent. Its surface lay fifteen thousand feet below the zero height. Its depth in places was a full three thousand. It was clear of mist tonight, the moonlight shimmered on its rippled surface, like pictures my father had often shown me of the former oceans. I passed, a little later, well to the westward of the vizured mountaintop of the Bermudas. There was nothing of this flight novel to me. I had frequently flown over the lowlands. I had descended into them many times, but never upon such a mission as was taking me there now. I was headed for Narita, capital village of the tiny lowland republic of Narita, which only five years ago came into national being as a protectorate of the United States. Its territory lies just north of the mountain highlands of Haiti, Santo Domingo, and Puerto Rico. A few hundred miles of tumbled lowlands embracing the turgid Nares Sea, whose bottom is the lowest point of all the Western Hemisphere, some thirty thousand feet below the zero height. The village of Narita is far down indeed. I had never been there. My charts showed it on the southern border of the Nary Sea, at minus twenty thousand feet, with the Mona Valley behind it like a gash in the steep upward slopes to the highlands of Puerto Rico and Haiti. Narita has a mixed population of typical lowland adventurers, among which 
the hardy Dutch predominate, and Holland and the United States have combined their influence in the world court to give it national identity. And out of this had arisen my mission now. Mercury, the quicksilver of commerce, so recently come to tremendous value through its universal use in the new antiseptics which bid fair to check all human diseases, was being produced in Narita. The import duty into the United States was being paid openly enough, but nevertheless, Hanley's agents believed that smuggling was taking place. It was to investigate this condition that Hanley was sending me. I had introduction to the Narita government officials. I was to consult with Hanley by ether phone in seeking the hidden source of the contraband quicksilver, but in the main to use my own judgment. A mission of diplomacy. I had no mind to pry openly among the people of these lowland depths, looking for smugglers. I might, indeed, find them too unexpectedly. Over-curious strangers are not welcomed by the lowlanders. Many have gone into the depths and have never returned. I was above the Nary Sea by midnight. I was still flying a thousand feet over the zero height. Twenty-one thousand feet below me lay the black expanse of water. The moon had climbed well toward the zenith now. Its silver shafts penetrated the hanging mist stratas. The surface of the Nary Sea was visible, dark and sullen-looking. I shifted the angles of incidence of the wings, reset my propeller angles, and made the necessary carburetor adjustments, switching on the supercharger, which would supply air at normal, zero-height pressure to the carburetors throughout my descent. I swung over Narita, the lights of the little village far down, dwarfed by the distance, showed like bleary, winking eyes through the mists. The jagged recesses of the Mona Valley were dark with shadow. The Nary Sea lay like some black monster asleep, and slowly, heavily panting. Moonlight was over me, with stars and fleecy white clouds. Calm, placid, atmospheric night was up here. But beneath, it all seemed so mysterious, fantastic, sinister. My heart was pounding as I put the wasp into a spiral and forced my way down. End of chapter 1